Okay, okay everybody. This is uh, Dr. Joe. Apologize for that. Uh, hope everyone's doing well on this Wednesday evening in, uh, you know, wherever you are. Again, it's another session of Wealth Wednesdays. My name is Joe Asamoa. Some people call me Dr. Joe. We've got another fantastic session lined up. And we're going to call this session the Landlord Takeover, how these landlords became winners. We're going to have some winners on this show. Uh, if you recall, last week I had three of my tenants, and uh, they provided their perspectives uh, on uh, from a, a, a landlord, uh, you know, sorry, from an, a tenant's perspective. And so today we are kind of showing uh, or showcasing from the landlord's perspective. And so we have three uh, landlords, um, intermediate and beginner in the, in landlords, who will be sharing their thoughts, uh, their trials and tribulations, their good, the bad, the ugly, and so on. So as I said before, you know my story. I bought a house, didn't know what I was doing, and uh, uh, trial by fire, as they call it. I learned all the mistakes, what not to do. I made them all. And, but as time went by, uh, I changed my strategies. And, uh, you know, so things are kind of uh, looking pretty good. So today we're going to have, as I said before, three of uh, landlords in the studio. So bring them in. And, uh, and then we'll have this interesting discussion that we're going to have. So let's have a look. There we are. There they are. We have the A team here. We have on the screen uh, Kevin, Joe, and Marlon. So without further ado, I want to introduce them. Uh, maybe they can introduce themselves. Uh, how about that? And uh, say something about themselves so that way you can connect with everybody, guys. So let's see who I start off with. Maybe start off with uh, Kevin. Do you want to kick it off? Sure. Hey, uh, everyone. How's it going? I'm Kevin Leahy, and I've known Joe for four or five years. Met him here in the D.C. area at a meetup. I was at a meetup and I said, I want to buy and hold properties in DC. How do I do that? And I was just talking to a random guy and the guy said, I know exactly who you need to talk to. And he walked me over and introduced me to Joe. And, uh, you know, Joe said, get out of here. Uh, and just kidding. Joe was super nice and wound up being a mentor to me. And I wound up working for bigger pockets as a podcast producer, um, and got Joe on that show and started a great partnership with bigger pockets. So, um, I own three properties here in DC. It's actually two properties. One of them is a duplex. So two, two tenants live in that building. Um, and I live in, in DC and, uh, the, the, the section eight strategy is the one that I've chosen to try to, um, build wealth as I continue to work my job. I'm not really a quit my job through real estate guy. It's, it's kind of something I do on the side, although I've learned to take it more seriously over the years. So I'm glad to be here and thanks for having me. Welcome. Thanks a lot, Kev. Yeah, I didn't tell you to get out of here today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Marlon, do you want to uh, say a few words about yourself? Who are you? <laughs> Good evening. Hello, everyone. My name is Marlon Allers. I'm a first time investor. I own one property in Washington, DC, but I live in Owens Mills, Maryland. Uh, I'm looking to scale uh, up and acquire more properties. And thanks for having me on the show uh, this evening. I greatly appreciate it. Welcome, Marlon. Joe, welcome. <laughs> yes, uh, Dr. Joe, thank you for having me here. Uh, so I'm Joe Simon, a local uh, investor in D.C. And uh, you know, I bought my first property in 2017 and I uh, met Dr. Joe, who also told me, uh, get out of here. No, he didn't. <laughs> And he, uh, I met him actually at a house he was showing uh, in uh, in D.C. And that was my first uh, contact with him. And so I rented my first property. Uh, I was doing a uh, buy the room strategy. It didn't work out much. But then I found out about Dr. Joe's uh, sex, Section 8 strategy. And I wanted to learn more. And so I ended up connecting. And uh, since then, I've learned a lot. And uh, I have about uh, six uh, properties uh, in DC and I'm looking to scale up and uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Welcome Joe. Okay. So let's get to it. As you guys know, uh, I'm into, there are lots of different real estate investing strategies. There's wholesaling, there's fix and flip, there's bird dogging, there's uh wholetailing, there's the, whatever it is. That's all, they're all out there. Uh, you, you know, I'm into the buy and hold model. It sounds like you three are all sort of uh, into that as well. My first question is, why did you opt to go with that strategy versus some of the other strategies? 
Okay, what appealed to you about the buy and hold versus some other ones? So maybe start off with you, Joe. Yes. Uh, so for me, the I've never sold a property. Actually, I've always wanted to buy and hold because it it provides that stable income, that prediction, and also it helps. Uh, you know, building with building wealth uh, over the years, uh, appreciation is is a great thing in real estate. Uh, you know, you have the mortgage pay down. Uh, you know, every time uh, you you got the rental income that's paying down your mortgage and building wealth. So to me, this is like, and it's also inflation resistant. As you uh, and I don't have to find a house, every, you know, to flip every every time. So that that that's why I went with the buy and hold uh, strategy. Okay, do you want to weigh in that, uh, Marlon? Yes, um, I wanted to uh, buy and hold because I wanted to provide quality housing for um, low-income families, but also uh, build wealth and get the appreciation as well as the principal pay down and uh, really make a difference in those families' lives that are in need. Mm -hmm. Okay, good one. Kev? I've, I've heard a lot of interviews with landlords who have been in the game a long time or people in real estate, and the one thing every single one of them would say is, I wish I would have kept more of the houses that I did renovations on over the years. I wish I didn't flip them. And I've even heard you say that, Joe, about some houses in, in very desirable neighborhoods that you may have flipped it and made a profit, but you were taxed highly on those profits. And then those profits sort of go away over time. And now those properties are worth two or three times as much. So I think that really stuck with me. And I think also self-awareness. I I realized that myself, I'm not a big risk taker. I'm maybe not as naturally uh, good of a salesperson or negotiator as some others who may thrive in wholesaling or going out and doing marketing and cold calling. It's not really my personality. I'm much more suited to working with tenants to try to solve their problems on a timetable and that works for them and try to get win-win scenarios rather than kind of going after it like a hardcore sales guy or gal. Mm -hmm. So I think it works for my personality. And um, I've tried my hand at those other parts of real estate of marketing really heavily and trying to get wholesaling deals. And and it didn't really work out. And I, I think to some extent, I kind of knew maybe that that wasn't my strong suit. And so I, I've committed to just buy and hold as the thing I want right. to really stick with. Right. So I know one of the things, uh, looking back, as you just alluded to, Kevin, there's three things that to at least I regret. One, I wish I started earlier. I mean, I, I started two years after I came to the US. I wish I started two days after. <laughs> so I wish I started earlier. Uh, I wish I bought more and I wish I kept more. Uh, that's sort of the, you know, looking back. So for anybody listening to this program, you know, you have to start. And the sooner you start, especially if you do the buy and hold model, you can let time work in your favor. You know, uh, a deal, a quote unquote, that doesn't look so attractive today, five, 10 years from now, you'll think, what a genius I was uh, <laughs> buying it five or 10 years earlier. So, you know, uh, it, it's just a matter of getting started. Obviously, you need to know what you're doing, but don't keep on waiting, waiting, waiting. At some point, you need to pull the trigger and, and so on. So with that said, let's talk about fears. Because that's what uh, I think uh, deep down a lot of people, uh, you know, cause them not to take action is fear. Okay. So, uh, you know, maybe you can start off with uh, Marlon. Some of the initial fears that you had, uh, you know, that sort of prevented you from, from pulling the trigger. Or did you have any fears? I know you don't look like a fearful guy. So, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, maybe you're fearless. <laughs> Well, speaking on that note, I didn't have any fears. Uh, it was more so getting my wife on board. Um, early in our marriage, I had watched an infomercial late at night, a uh, company coming in town for the weekend, and I went and increased the limit on my credit cards to purchase their little packet, and that was a disaster. And so it kind of shied her away from investing. Um, so... Um, years down the road, we tried it again and, uh, she was on board. So, um, I really didn't have any fears. It was more so learning how to get the money okay. so you can uh, acquire the asset. Okay. 
fearless, huh? Okay. Once you, once your wife's on board, are you fearless? <laughs> well, I'm a risk. I'm a risk taker, and she's not. So okay, I don't, I don't, I don't. It's very hard to do this if your wife's not on board. If you're married, or if your spouse is not on board, it's really hard, and so on. Kevin, so do you have any fears about uh, getting into uh, real estate investing, or, or or not really? I think I would have been pretty fearful if I jumped in with uh, flipping a property and doing construction since I didn't have any background in that. So I've always dealt with properties that have been pretty, pretty much in good shape when I have bought them. And maybe there have been some small repairs to do and then I can handle those. Um, so that's kind of one way that I managed my fear was to say, well, even if you know the the furnace goes out or something like that, it's not like I need to gut the whole house and I, I'm going to be learning this on this two hundred thousand dollar project or something like that. It's, it'd be like a three thousand dollar deck or a patio or something. So that's kind of one way I mitigated my fears. And another one was I got into it through properties that I was living in. So I did the house hacking model where you purchase with lower. Um, debt finance, uh, lower interest rate uh, financing because it's owner occupied loans. And so the, the banks see you as a less risky borrower. Yeah. If you're buying a property, you're actually going to live in. Um, they're basing that off of, you know, with rentals, that's where people get in trouble, like back before the Great Recession, where folks were buying a bunch of rentals and hoping that they would appreciate and then they just walked away from them when the value went down. But if it's your house, you don't really want to lose your house and have to move in with family or something. So people will do everything they can to keep their house. So you get better financing. So there's less of that fear with like short term loans. How am I going to pay this off? Um, you, you know what your payment's going to be for the next 30 years. You know inflation's going to go up. Hopefully you'll make more money in the future. And you know your expenses will go up a little bit, but not your main expense is your mortgage and that will stay the same. So fixed rate financing, yeah. primary residence. Yeah. If the rental part doesn't work out and I can't rent the upper unit, well, okay, then I have I have to pay the whole note myself. But I, I always did it in a way where I knew I could do that yeah. if, if absolutely necessary. Yeah. So I really took baby steps because I'm not as uh, risk tolerant as Marlon over there. Feel as well, huh? he, he strikes fear into all of us. <laughs> okay, what about you, Joe? I mean, uh, fears. Well, uh, you know, did you have any, and uh, how did you overcome some of those things? Well, well, first I started uh, fearless. You know, I went. Uh, <laughs> you know, I bought a I bought a triplex, and I wanted to live in a top unit. It was already already renovated, so I was like, "Oh, that's easy." You know. I start getting fearful as I get in, uh, you know, trying to uh, rent out the, the property, you know, to tenants. And I got even more fearful when I started renovating, um, you know, doing full gut renovation. Yeah. To me, that was like something that I never even thought of, like, you know, all the stuff that it's involved. But I was able to come, you know, uh, basically, uh, you know, what helped me with my fear is basically having the right mentor. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Joe, so you, I mean, your help was through the, the tenant screening, you know, part of the construction. So having the right team kind of helped me through uh, through this uh, process. But um, so yeah, you know, went from fearless, fearful. Now I'm a bit less uh, <laughs> fearful than before. That's crazy, yeah? But uh, <laughs> learning, learning everything. Well, I think what's interesting here, uh, you know, it sounds like Kevin and Joe uh, started off using the sort of uh, a modified version of the house hacking strategy. You know, you need some place to live. Uh, the, the biggest expense for most people is a housing expense. If they can cut that down, okay, then, uh, you know, it makes it a lot easier. Obviously, if it's your primary residence, you can get better financing and, uh, you know, you can reduce your housing costs. And it kind of makes it a bit more easier, I suppose. And then you can then graduate from there. So maybe for people listening, you may want to explore the house hacking strategy if, you want to, if you're kind of unsure about pulling the trigger. Uh, because it's definitely a, a good way to go by it. And then you can then push it from there and so on and so forth. Okay. So, okay. So let's talk about your first experience, your first foray into this. Uh, you, okay. So you, you've got over your fears. You've decided to pull the trigger. Okay. And, and then the real world kicks in. So let's talk about your first deal or your first purchase or your first acquisition and some of the things that you learned, the good, the bad, the ugly from that first. Because you know, we'll, we'll go down uh, as time goes by, you get more experience. But let's talk about the first one. 
and what you learned from that, if any. Kev? Yeah. Um, let me actually talk about the property that I purchased without even thinking it would be a rental. And then I turned it into a rental. Um, okay. And it was a one bedroom condo in, in uh, Washington, D.C., in a very nice area. And I, it was my principal residence. But when I went out of town for a weekend in 2015, I had heard of this thing called Airbnb. And I thought, why don't I put my place up on Airbnb? And this will be a way I can see how it feels to be a landlord. But I'm not taking much of a risk because they need to be out of my house in two days when I come back. Um, so, <laughs> right. uh, and, and that was really a perfect entree for me into, into landlording. Cause you figure out, you know, how to market your property, how to put nice photos and write a nice description and put it out there, how to manage people's expectations around the rules that you expect, uh, them to treat your, your house. But then also I learned, let's say the uh, not not necessarily the dark side, but some of the things you need to be careful of when you go in and buy a property. So with condominiums, you just have to be careful because they have their own set of rules. You're living with other people in a and there's a common area and people share expenses. So everyone chips in every month and then uh, common expenses are paid through a fund and there's a condo board that kind of rules the the roost at the condo building. And so I didn't realize that Airbnb was forbidden under the condo rules. And I was actually on the board of the condo, believe it or not. And I was, I look really young now, but this was eight years ago. And I looked like I was 18 years old and I was on the board of this condo. And then they, you know, they sent out an email saying there's an anonymous owner on the board who is Airbnb their house out. We will not name this person, but what do you think the punishment for this person should be? And I was the first person to reply all to that email and said, let's just give them a warning. That's really messed up that they're doing that. But I think we can warn them. The rules weren't quite clear, but next time we'll really crack down. And I took my listing down and stopped doing Airbnb. But it was the first time that I realized you really have to know the rules of the game. And if you want to do rentals in a condo, for example, and a lot of people are tempted to do that because condos are kind of some of the cheaper properties in cities, um, just know what you're getting into. And I think there's a lot with the city and inspections and things that if you just jump in without knowing those things or asking a mentor like Dr. Joe, who has property in your jurisdiction, you could be in for a rude awakening. You know, if you're told all of a sudden, well, you can't do that. You can't rent that out. If I had run all my numbers based on Airbnb, yeah. well, that would have been a problem for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so did you ever implement airbnb or you were scared off by that letter and then you decided not to i did it i honored everyone who had booked up to <laughs> up to that moment and then what i did is i turned it into a longer term rental okay. but of course longer term rentals tend to be lower cash flow than airbnb especially in certain areas and so that rental for me it about breaks even um earlier joe uh, joe s talked about the principal pay down, which I like. So I'm paying down that loan little by little, even though the cash flow is not really life changing yeah. for me. And it's a very low maintenance property yeah. uh, with low condo fees. And so yeah. I've kept that as okay. a rental and, okay. and someday I'll sell it and transfer into a, a single family okay. house. Okay. Uh, Marlon. So what about, uh, what's it called your first deal and, uh, or your first acquisition and kind of talked about how that turned out. Well, it's turning out. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, it's turning out great. Um, so the tenant is all settled in. And um, the lessons that I learned was to act quick, act, take action quickly. Um, it was a few things that uh, I wasn't sure of. So um, now with those lessons learned, um, just to take action quicker, um, now that I know what I can do and what I cannot do. Right. But your your project was a major renovation, if I recall, or a mid-level renovation. Mid-level mid renovation. Yes, mid -level. So you, in, in addition to acquiring the property, uh, you had to sort of uh, transform it to the to where it is. Yes. And uh, so kind of share with the, the audience what you had to do in order to be able to implement the strategy that you're doing now. Okay. So with that, uh, the... House was listed as a two one, 
and it had a, an addition on the back, which was a bump out, but it was never recorded uh, with DC. So I turned the two one into a four two uh, by um, adding. Well, a, oh, oh, you're talking code here. Four two is a four bedroom, so, two bathroom. So, so it, 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 it was a two two bed, two bedroom, one bath home, right. and then I made it four bedrooms with two bathrooms. Right. And so uh, I was able to do that with utilizing the space in the basement uh, by putting a bedroom in the basement as well as an additional bathroom and uh, just pretty much did the cosmetic work yeah. on the first level and the second level okay. and painted the exterior. Right. But um, by it being a mid-level renovation, um, I did have to pull uh, the pop proper permits to uh, do the additional work that was required in the basement. Right. Okay. Now we're going to get to that. In this it's probably the next thing is the rationale behind adding extra bedrooms. Because um, I know that uh, one of the projects that I've seen Joe do, uh, has done or is doing, uh, he's, done some, he's done some crazy uh, <laughs> number of bedroom additions here. So talk about some of the deals that you've done, or maybe talk about the first one, Joe. And then kind of uh, talk to us about some of the other ones that you've done as well. Yeah. So uh, before the house hack, actually, I did buy a, a, a property in Frederick, Maryland uh, as an investment uh, separately. And that was actually an REO property, a bank owned property that uh, I was able to find uh, with my agent at that time. So uh, well, I didn't know that thing existed at first. And that uh, bank owned property actually was uh, at, a, at a discount uh, when I bought it, and uh, it was it's, it's been doing pretty well, and it's rented to a market tenant. Uh, but with the uh, the house hack, that was actually my you know, I feel like this, the, the bigger projects that I've done the first time is the house hack uh, triplex. So I, I lived in one unit, but so the major things that I faced at that time was uh, you know overcoming the fear of renovation it was even actually it wasn't heavy renovation it, it was uh, it was some uh, light uh, to medium renovation but i did run into issues with the contractor at that time you know they fixed things but uh that would have leaks after they fixed them and you know i had to get another contractor later so that was one issue uh another fear that i had it was uh you know how i'm gonna rent the uh the units below because it was rented by the rooms from the previous owner yeah. and so now it, i had to deal with a lot of turnover uh so that was another thing that i didn't like to deal with uh you know because i have a full-time job and i this was a, a side hustle for me and i didn't want it to turn into a full-time so I, that's how i found out about you know basically try to uh, do longer term uh, leases uh, with Section 8. And, uh, you know, that helped uh, lessen the turnover uh, yeah. over time. So that helped for sure. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I can talk about the other ones that I'm currently working on. <laughs> uh, well, because uh, I know what, I did a project. Uh, we just, the tenant just moved in there July the 14th. It was a two bedroom, two and a half bath when I bought it. And we turned it into a six bedroom, four bath. Um, you know, after all is said and done. And uh, I want to get to the reasons why we are doing that. Okay. Um, you know, so let's talk, about, you know, so as you all know, uh, the audience knows, I'm into Section 8. And, uh, and I, I wanted to have human beings last week. So you can see that these tenants, they would have three heads. <laughs> yeah, they're not psychos, crazos. They're regular people. And uh, so I wanted to provide that human perspective. So maybe we can talk about Section 8. Okay. Some of you have done Section 8. Some of you have done market as well. So let's talk about Section 8. First of all, before you heard Section 8, uh, what do you think the stereotypical view of a Section 8 landlord, okay, is? Okay, so a Section 8, when you hear the word Section 8 landlord, okay, what comes into your mind? And, uh, and was that what was coming in before you met me or before you kind of delve further into the reality? So let's, uh, who's I start? I think it's Joe's turn to kick it off. Joe? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of assumptions out there, uh, you know, but uh, yeah, with landlords, I mean, 
Uh, I always hear that the slum lords, they don't take care of the properties and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, that's, that's what I kept hearing. But then when I, you know, uh, knew about you, Dr. Joe, I noticed how you actually treat the tenants, you know, how you take care of the properties. And that kind of inspired me, you know. Uh, so, and the reason why I'm doing this, actually, I kind of, you know, I didn't mention is that you know, I was inspired from one of your uh, Instagram videos that you had one time uh, where you, uh, you know, a family, you uh, they were moving in to the new house and they were cutting the, the ribbon. I was like, oh, wow, this is, and I saw the whole family members kind of like excited, you know, and uh, it was a very like, you know, emotional for the family. And that kind of actually inspired me and, uh, you know, made me think about why we do this and how we actually, you know, housing uh, children. They're going to school. You're uh, making their future better because they're living in a better neighborhood and a better house. So uh, that, that definitely why I'm here. <laughs> So in a nutshell. Okay. 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 That's good. Yeah. So when uh, anybody want to add to Kevin or Marlon, the, the, the whole stereotypical, what brought into your mind about section eight landlords before you met me and so on, what, what kind of came into your mind? I think there's a lot of landlords that wind up doing section eight as a last resort or a second option because they got, they bought a building and then they realized, Oh, maybe I can make a few more bucks doing section eight. So let me just do that. And, uh, you know, they're, they're not really building a business model and a business and with real values intentionally around targeting a certain uh, type of tenant who, who has certain wants and needs that are not far off from anyone else's wants and needs, but, but are looking for a very specific product. And so I think what you've done, Joe, that's smart is identify what that product is, figure out how your business and your, you know, financing and numbers can work to deliver that product, like that HGTV quality uh, house. That's a single family home, which is a very sort of in demand product, especially in like urban areas. And then interact with those tenants in a way that they're not used to. They're, they're used to getting the short end of the stick from people um, who are involved figures of a, uh, authority or folks connected to the government. Um, Section eight tenants have to deal with a lot of that in their everyday life. And so when they have someone like Joe that says, I'm going to treat you like the human being that you are and just deal with you very straight up. And if you're straight up with me, this can be a great win-win relationship. I think they really respond well to that. Um, so, you know, the, the stereotypes thing is true. And then I think just one last thing, people have a misconception about, well, Section 8, I think I thought to myself that that means it's a large housing project, what people refer to as the projects, where it's a gov every single unit in the apartment is maybe subsidized rent by the city. Um, but that's not really the Section 8 program. The Section 8 program is made up of vouchers, um, or at least a large part of it, that families can go and take to subsidize part of their rent in any part of the city, yep. living in a house or an apartment. So I just didn't know that myself, that a family can rent a three, four or five bedroom house using their housing voucher rather than living in one of these big high rise buildings where everyone's kind of packed in together. So maybe that's an important distinction for yeah. people to understand. Sure. Good one. Uh, Marlon, is there anything you want to add before I go into the, the next phase of topics? Sure. So uh, my understanding of Section 8 prior to meeting you was um, what I witnessed for years. Tenants uh, living pretty in unhealthy conditions and the landlords just doing enough to get by because it was guaranteed income for them. But it was really no quality of living for the tenant. But um, after, after meeting you and watching how you strategize to you know, give them a quality place to stay and then how you nurture the relationship. It changed my perspective of what I saw growing up. Yeah, good. Okay, we're kind of, uh, it's now 7.30 local time. We're going to do a QA and a in about five or 10 minutes. So if you've got some questions that you want to pose to uh, our esteemed guests, uh, please put them in the chat box. And so again, add any questions to the comments chat box. Also, I just want a little plug. We're going to have a master class. Uh, I think it's August the 25th. Uh, we're going to kind of drill down more into the sort of how to make money, real estate investing, uh, you know, the reduced turnover, 
uh, you know, kind of that's the key: reduce turnover, minimize eviction, minimize all those horror stories that you hear about landing. I'm going to do a master class on that, so stay tuned for that. Uh, and oh, okay, there it is: https bit.ly slash landlord masterclass. So you can register there, which will be, I think, kicking off on Thursday, August the 25th. So again, get your questions together, and we'll be going to Q and A very shortly. Okay. So with that said. We've, we've decided that we've addressed our fears. We decided that we're going to pull the trigger. We've decided that we're going to go with Section 8. And we decide that buy and hold is the way to go. Okay? we're all That's where we are at this point. Now, at some point, we're going to have to go find tenants. Okay? And we're going to have to screen our tenants, select them uh, first. I'll, I'll, let's do that first. And then afterwards, I want to talk about nurturing that relationship once they move in so i'm gonna break it into two parts okay the first one is that you all got you all you guys have got tenants now okay you had to go through a process to go find these tenants how scary was that how intimidating was that what did you do to ultimately select the tenants that you have so let's go with that first uh marlon do you want to kick it off sure so um i advertised on zillow as well as um craigslist and the screening process, um, I wasn't sure because it was my first go around. I, I didn't know what to expect. Um, but um, with your guidance, um, you gave me the confidence to do it. So um, in doing that, um, I took the applicants that applied and did the background checks as well as um, the ones that made it to the next phase. I did a home visit as part of your strategy okay. and narrowed down to three people. Okay. And then fr from those three, then I was able to select the one. Okay. I'm gonna, maybe I'll pose it. Okay. Let me ask you that question. Now. What was the most intimidating part of that entire process for you? Not you knowing not knowing who was going to show up to, to apply for my house. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, you know, it's different personalities. And, and again, you know, watching the Section 8 growing up, I wasn't sure who was going to come and... <laughs> You know what was what was gonna come? <laughs> yeah, so I I was open, but a, after the first day of showing the property, I felt a little bit more comfortable the the rest of the week because I did it for a whole week. Um. So, but that first day, it was it was I was just unsure. It, it, you know, it, it was new territory for me. So, you know. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Well. Okay. We'll get to that one in a second. So, Joe. Uh, okay, so how was that experience? Uh, how did you go about selecting the tenants that you have? And uh, what was the most intimidating part of that process before you? And why did you select the people that you did? Why? Yeah, so just like Marlon, I also you know listed it on on Zillow, uh, you know, and also like the local website uh, for the housing authority. But uh, the first time it was it was uh, it was scary. Like at first, you know. You know, showing up at the house like to, to someone that you never met before, like what I'm gonna talk about, like other than okay, this is the house, like what are kind of questions that I'm gonna come up with? So I had like a list of questions that I kind of prepared, you know, and uh, you know, like you know, where do you work? I'm trying to make a con conversation because at the end, it's a personal relationship I'm trying to build with a tenant. So uh, anyone that I tried to connect with, you know, that that felt like comfortable with. Uh, that's why I ended up going with. Okay, I also set the expectation. Uh, you know, after a couple of showings, I kind of like, okay, now I know what to talk about. I'll set expectations of what I'm expecting. Like, I'm the greatest landlord. I'm looking for the best tenant. Uh, so that was kind of like my strategy, and that would kind of like tell you who's serious and who's not, who's gonna take care of the property and who's not. Yeah. So, and that's kind of was my filter uh, okay. at the end. Yeah. Okay. How about you, Kev? Uh, you know, how did you go about selecting your tenants that you have? And what was the most scary part of that process? I advertise on Zillow as well heavily. And Zillow shoots to a bunch of other sites. And a lot of leads come through Zillow. But I don't use their application. A lot of people just say, send me an application through Zillow. And I don't use theirs. I want to control the questions that are on my application. And just I want a little bit more control over the process. So I use a software called Airtable. That's like a spreadsheet. But it has a form that you can send people. So I generate my own link. And then when I speak with people in Zillow, and it seems like it might be a good fit, 
um, what I do is I set up a, a link where people can book uh, an appointment with me through a software called Calendly. And then what that does is it kind of helps filter through the people who are really serious about actually moving and getting a place because um, they will care enough. I say, great, thanks for your interest. Can we do a five minute phone call? I just want to make sure the place is a good fit for you before we move any further because you know, I know that I'll burn myself out if I'm driving over to this property and showing people that really aren't serious or they're not showing up. So I want them to have some skin in the game uh, before we go to a real showing. And then I'll do a phone screen with them. Just ask them basic questions. Why are you moving? Um, when can you move by? You know, if they say in two months, well, that's probably not going to work for my timetable. So I just make sure that it's a good fit. And if it is, I'll say, great, I'm going to send you the application and then what I'll do is I'll try to schedule a day where I can show the property to a few different people around the same time. So I might identify a window of like two hours on a Saturday uh, morning or Sunday morning. And then I will try to get multiple people to come at once. And that way it creates a little healthy sense of competition maybe among the tenants uh, if other people are there. But also it just maximizes the time. And if one person doesn't show up, at least I'm getting something out of it. Um, and then, you know, I, I don't try to hide anything negative about the property. So one of my apartment units has uh, no conventional closets that are built into the bedrooms. They are more like portable units that are in there. And I, I think initially I had thought, well, I need to keep that. I don't want to bring that out in the open right away. But now I say, listen, if this is a deal breaker for you, I totally understand. So I just want to let you know and be upfront about this and if you have a ton of stuff, then right. it, it might not be the best place. Um, right. So just trying to look at it more as finding the fit versus yeah. why well, I'm screening the, screening out so and so. Okay. Now I know that uh, I'm a big. I think I remember the first time I went on Bigger Pockets, and I, I I told them my screening process, and I also said I also go visit, do a home visit. I, I remember Brandon was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> you do what <laughs> you know and uh, i don't know if you guys have done home visits i know it's very scary for a lot of people um you know when you do your first home visit what was your thoughts uh anybody want to joe do you want to i, I felt i felt uncomfortable oh, yeah. uh, i i you know i thought that's what marlon was gonna say earlier marlon was just worried about who was gonna show up but i the to me the most intimidating part of the process was asking the person if i could go uh see their home. Um, and like Joe says, you know, the, the way their home looks now, um, is the way that your home is going to look a month after they move into it. And, and that's, there's a ton of truth in that. And so I do think it's one of those questions that if you put it to the, to a tenant, who's not the right fit, they may react in a negative way. And that might be uncomfortable for a few seconds, but it tells you something that it's probably not the right fit. Yeah. Um, so I've done it once and the, one time I've done it has been the best tenant for me who is a, a current um, tenant who lives where I used to live in an apartment where I used to live. Um, it's also nice to give some credibility when you can say, I used to live in this unit and now I'm renting it to you. It just shows them that you care. It's safe enough for you to live there. It's, it's right. quality. Right. Uh, but, but it went really well. And it was clear to me that this person was a quality person who this was her first time uh, using the voucher and um, she has been nothing but a pleasure to deal with. And so I think it's yeah. a really wise thing to do. Yeah. And it's all about positioning it in the right way yeah. and not coming off as condescending or like you are somehow trying to get them in trouble. It's not about that. It's about um, yeah. establishing a long-term relationship. Yeah. How was your first visit, uh, Marlon, when you went go? Were you scared? Uh, <laughs> Wait, I'm, I'm sorry, you're, fear, you're fearless. I'm sorry. No, I, I was nervous. <laughs> I, was, I was nervous um, because I didn't know if something was going to jump out. <laughs> you know, you, I didn't know what I was walking into. But, um, <laughs> after walking in and going through uh, the whole place, it was clean. Uh, under the beds were clean and the closet. You know, it wasn't like somebody did a quick cleanup and just threw everything in the garbage bag and set it outside. Um, the, she kept a well clean place. So it was. Yeah. But initially walk, walking up to it um, and finding parking, I had to park 
maybe like almost a block and a half away um, because it was only street parking around there. So, okay, it was a good experience overall. But initially walking in, I didn't know what to expect. Yeah. Uh, how how was your first experience, Joe? Do the a uh, 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 home visit. Now, first, I want to ask Marlon: Did you smell any strong bleach? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no oh. strong bleach. Oh, okay, uh, pine soul. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I do. Rem- I actually my my the first home visit I did is very memorable because actually Dr. Joe was with me. <laughs> I don't know if remember that, Dr. Joe, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you were there the, per- the first time actually I did the home visit and um, it actually helped me, you know, to see what you look for and see how you communicate um, with the prospective tenant and how you connect with the kids. That's the other thing. We try to connect with the different members of the family because you want to try to, you know, have a feel of the family. Like, are we a good fit? Are you a good fit for the house, for the property? Are you going to take care of the house? And, um, you know that was that was the first one and the, you know the second one actually like uh it was easier like so I've, I've, I've done i think three four so far so it's been uh, easier every time and kind of learn how to get, become more personable you know uh you know and just try to establish kind of like this relationship with the tenant and i try not to come out as a, like i'm landlord i'm coming to you know see your house you know it's just you know uh okay. yeah yeah. Good stuff. Okay, we got some questions. I think the, my producer uh, is giving me a cue here to show up talking and ask some questions. <laughs> so, uh, what's it called? So, first question we got here from Tai. Hope I pronounced that uh, correctly. Tai, the question is Is there any way to get larger rents for Section 8 rentals other than increasing the number of bedrooms? Sometimes Section 8 rents are below market rent. So she wants to know, are there any other ways to increase the number of bed, uh, to get your rent other than increasing the number of uh, bedrooms? Uh, anybody want to weigh in on that one? Well, I think the other major variable in the cost is the neighborhood itself. So, you know, time may already know that, but um, it, depending on the neighborhood, uh, the housing authority will pay different rents. Um, so, the other thing you can do is just try to look and find those sweet spot neighborhoods where you might be able to acquire a property for that number, that same uh, dollar figure, but the rents are higher per bedroom in that in that neighborhood. So that's kind of what Joe has done and uh, breaking down. You should know off the top of your head if you're sort of looking around and analyzing a lot of deals. Well, if that's in that neighborhood, I know I can get that much. So that's kind of what comes to mind for me. It might seem obvious. Yeah. Anything you want to add, uh, Joe? Or, uh, yeah. I think, I mean, the other idea that I can think of is uh, like the condition of the house or, or the, you know, and the unit is trying to rent and reaching out to the local housing authority. I mean, I think if, uh, you, you know, if you reach out and you show them the comps for the house that you're trying to rent that is in great condition, and to show them like what the current rent they are offering is below that, I think they're reasonable people and they can take, they can take that into consideration. Mm-hmm. Marlon, you want to add anything? No, I don't have anything. You know, the last thing I'll say is I've noticed there are other strategies that involve government programs that are not necessarily the Section 8 or Housing Choice vo- housing Voucher Program, but you could look into those things because there are, I'm sure there are other opportunities. Um, I'm sure there's a Dr. Joe for uh, veteran housing in DC or um, assisted yeah. living or it, developmentally uh, disabled folks. I see some of these properties in my neighborhood where I live. They're usually one story because people might have issues with mobility. And it's very clear to me that a real estate investor, a very smart investor found a niche and they yeah. created you know, they turned a single family house into more of an assisted living facility or something. So it might just be something to look into depending on, you know, yeah. finding that. Yeah. The other thing I want to add, uh, Toya, is that um, I know this is contrar- c- contrarian, uh, but uh, sometimes the reason why I like Section 8 is especially some of the, um, the rental assistance type programs is that the tenants tend to stay longer, okay? And uh, that's been my experience. You know, I mean, I had last year, the 25-year tenant, 12-year tenant, and so forth. 
if they if you have a product that's in a nice area and uh, it meets their needs, they tend to stay much longer than the market renter. So the point I'm trying to make is that the real expense as a landlord, I'm sure the, the guests here will attest to that, is the turnover cost. The turnover costs are so, so high relative to the rent that you get that sometimes if you can get somebody there that stays a long time at a slightly lower rent, you usually end up making more money than getting a slightly higher rent but having more turnover. Okay? So, you know, it's not always about how much can I maximize my rent or whatever it is. Sometimes you have to kind of take a long-term view. If you can get someone that's going to stay a long time and you're in an area that appreciates in value, you'll end up making more money through appreciation and minimizing turnover than you will by getting an extra $50, $100 a month in rent. That is my experience. A lot of people don't want to hear that. Uh, but I think experienced landlords, uh, I think a, a lot of them are sympathetic to what I'm saying. And Joe, I can, I can attest to that. Having recently gone through a turnover on a property that looks really good on paper, and it's still a great property, but the, the monthly spreadsheet magic shows that this is an incredible property. But then when I'm looking now, I have my income and expense statement up for the month of July. I have snake the drain in the bathroom, $500 handyman work, uh, hallway trash, 150 handyman work. Number two, 300 replace toilet, 700. Now this was not a bad tenant. It just, there's wear and tear and you have to do things when you turn over a, uh, a unit. And then I had to get the place cleaned. Then I needed one more contractor to do one more thing. Then I had to get the place cleaned again. So all this added up to maybe $3,000 worth of work. Um, and so these these turnovers will kill you. And so that is an, a hidden benefit that, that you might not see on a month-to-month -month basis, but over time, it's really going to help. Yeah. So it's a, bear that in mind, Ty, is that, uh, you know, my thing is I don't want turnover because as Kevin was just, each turnover is going to cost you at least minimum one month's rent and probably two to three months. So if you can cut that down, you'll end up saving a lot of money, even though your rent may be slightly lower. Okay, I think she's got another question. How do you all plan to scale up your portfolios? And do you plan to continue investing in Washington, D.C. area? Joe, do you want to kick it off? Uh, yes. So basically, I mean, it's, it's all about, you know, finding, uh, partnering. So I have partners. Uh, that's how I'm able to scale up. And uh, also raising uh, private money. Uh, that's another thing. Uh, you know, in order to have... Uh, the necessary funds to, uh, you know, buy and renovate the property. Uh, and then, yes, I like DC. I'm comfortable here. And uh, so far, the cash flow and appreciation I can get here. So, uh, you know, for me, DC now is a, is a good market for what I'm doing. Uh, and I'm planning on keeping doing that. Uh, Marlon, do you want to add in uh, what's it called? How do you plan to scale your portfolio? And um, are you going to continue locally or are you going to kind of branch out? Um, I'm planning to uh, continue to invest in Washington, D.C., but also uh, parts of Maryland. And that's how I'm planning to scale my portfolio. Um, I'm going to diversify um, some things here in Maryland uh, on the Airbnb side of things. Okay. Uh, Kevin, anything you want to add about where, where, which direction you're going? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue investing in Washington, D.C., but I, I'm probably going to scale like responsibly is how I would put it. And there's a philosophy out there with the stock market of not trying to even time the market. Just buying stocks consistently over time is like kind of the best strategy, regardless of what's happening in the market. Because if you look at the historical returns, they go up over time and you'll drive yourself crazy if you try to time things perfectly. So I take the philosophy of, for me personally, I don't, I'm just not as motivated to scale fast as some other people are. And that's just, everyone's situation is different. So I'm okay waiting four or five years, even if it takes that long for me to save a down payment. I think I'd rather have a smaller amount of properties that are worth more than a larger amount of properties um, that, that are worth less. Um, it just given quality of life and I want things to be close to each other. So that's personally my vision. So I think I'll probably buy a property every 
four or five years for the next 20 years. And then, you know, that, that's multi millions of dollars right there. Okay, good. So I always ask this question, um, knowing what you know now, what would you tell your younger self? <laughs> okay, so uh, I don't know which of you guys are the youngest or the eldest, but uh, I'll start off with Marlon. <laughs> Marlon, what would you say to your younger self, knowing what you know now? About, um, real, estate start investing, about real estate investing, about just, just you know, the experiences that you've learned, um, you know, on this journey of yours. I would have started sooner. That's what I would say to my younger self. Start sooner and um, learn learn all you can and implement those strategies as soon as possible. Mm. Um, don't let analysis paralysis kick in yeah. because that, that, that holds a lot of people back from investing. Yeah. Yeah. Joe, is there anything you want to add to that? What what would you tell your younger son? I know you're a young guy anyway, but uh, oh, you all three of you are young compared to me. Uh, my, my hat says otherwise, but okay. <laughs> so, what would you tell your younger self, knowing what you know now? Uh, well, for me, it just fail fast. You know, <laughs> you know, it's it's like if you want to do something, just don't overthink it. Just do it. Uh, you know, because the more you think about it, the more you have doubts, and uh, you're not gonna do it. Just do it, fail fast if you're young, you know, and uh, time will help. And the other thing is like, try to get a mentor as soon as possible because the, you know, you wanna do mistakes, but you wanna, you know, lessen the, you know, the number of mistakes you're gonna do. And right. the sooner you get someone who knows what they're doing and someone who's been, you know, doing this before you, and, uh, you know, it will help you prevent uh, further mistakes and, you know, not reinventing the wheel. So yeah. that's that's what I would tell myself. Yeah. Kev, do you want to add to that? What would you tell your younger self? Buy a house somewhere where you, you know, within, hopefully it's close to your workplace. Um, buy a house in your 20s that has multiple rooms that you can rent out to your friends or people your age. And I think that's a win-win. And I think it will be fun, actually, to own the property and live with a bunch of people and be able to control who lives with you. And, um, you know, I, I just think that's the best way to get started. And I think once you reach a certain age, or maybe you find your spouse, um, and then you have start a family life, that chapter has closed. You're not, it, you know, me, my wife, and my one and a half year old are not moving into a seven bedroom house and renting the rooms. But I could have done that in my uh, 20s had I known about these strategies. I just didn't quite know yeah. about them yet so that would be my number one piece of yeah. advice to people yeah because I, I know uh I, I went to a meeting when, when, I, when i came into this country uh someone told me a wise man learns from his mistakes a genius learns from other people's mistakes uh i mean the the, the, the gist is that as, as i think marlon was saying there's no or somebody was saying you, there's no need to recreate the wheel uh, there are other people who have paved the way and it's all well and good to learn from your mistakes. But why make mistakes if you don't have to? <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, there are other seasoned investors, whether it be me, like Dr. Joe, or other people out here who know, who you know, they've, they've got the, uh, the scars and the wounds to prove it. So learn from them such that you don't have to make the same mistakes that they've made. And therefore, you can get to where you need to go to a lot faster. Uh, that is one of the biggest lessons I think, uh, you know, I've learned is that there are people out there, if you can somehow incentivize them to work with you, you can just cut down a number of headaches, frustrations, pain, uh, that you don't have to make. Okay. So Chris has got a question. Okay. If you got some questions, we've got a couple more minutes, fire them away and, uh, we'll try to get to them. But again, we have a masterclass, August 25th, please sign up for that one. Chris is question is have you invested into opportunity zones in your area or considered doing so opportunity zones anybody wants to weigh in on that one well I think I've, I've heard of it that is uh, you know in certain neighborhoods like the the city or the local government they try to incentivize investors to put money in there I kind of looked into it at one point but it just didn't make sense to me. Uh, I know it's a way to defer taxes uh, over time, and that helps you, you know, uh, kind of scale up. 
and uh, there's some tax benefit to that. But to me, I just wanted to invest where the numbers made sense. And so, so far, I have not invested into an opportunity zone. Uh, it did not make sense for me yet, uh, at least with the scale that I'm doing. Maybe if for bigger properties, it might. I think for 99% of people, that's probably too complicated of a of a thing to take on. Absolutely for your first deal, but that's probably something you do for your 50th deal. And I think it also is more advantageous to people who are selling a large amount of an asset. So let's say, Chris, you had exited a company that you started or something and you sold it for like 5 million bucks and you had dumped that money into something, then you might want to look at an opportunity zone and talk to an expert um, to defer that tax so you don't have to take a hit on that money. But, but I think for the typical investor, you know, look at all the other ways that are much more simple that the government is incentivizing you that they, you know, rental income is not taxed at the same rate as other income. You, you pretty much don't get taxed on it because there's all these expenses. They give you the break on the owner occupied financing. Section eight provides a lot of stability. So to me, there's a lot of lower hanging fruit that a guy like me can wrap his head around um, before getting into those levels like opportunity zones. That's my take. Okay. Uh, anything you want to add on that, Marlon? No, I don't have anything to add. Good. Okay. So, uh, one question. I, I want to ask this question: repairs, maintenance, tenant issues, <laughs> three a.m. toilet calls. <laughs> 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 you know, uh, I, I think we need to talk about some of the. Uh, you know, how do you handle uh, repairs, maintenance, and uh, based on what you know now? compared to uh, what you didn't know before. Uh, I'd like to hear how you guys handle it. Anybody, uh, Joe, do you want to kick it off first? Yeah. So, I mean, for me, I, since I still kind of have a manageable portfolio, I still self-manage. So anytime I, I try to have all uh, maintenance requests through email, I, I don't want just text unless it's a, you know, an emergency, they can call my number, but most of the times right now, I just get it to, um, you know, maintenance requests through the email. And then if it's urgent, uh, you know, uh, I, you know, I can call the handyman that I work with all the time. And if it needs more specialized, like a plumbing, I, I have a plumber that I can work with. Uh, so it's all about having the right team. And, uh, and I have, a, you know, depends on the issue. I have someone for that. So that's how I manage it. But I'm sure as I scale up, I will have Okay. Maybe someone else handle these calls. Okay. Kevin, you want to add? I self-manage as well. Um, and I think, you know, I, I tried to do some things myself at first. And I, not only am I not that good at it as far as doing maintenance and handy work, I, I also don't enjoy it. So it's really something that would burn me out if I tried to do that work myself. So even now, if it's a very small job, I don't even touch it. I try to get a handyman, as Joe said, um, and you just have to try different people out, see if they're reliable and network with other investors. Like if you have a mentor like Joe, you can ask them if they know certain handymen or tradesmen. Um, and then one thing I would say is you have a lockbox on your property so that you don't have to go over and let the person in, the contractor. As long as you trust them, you should be able to have that lockbox with a key they let themselves in and you can always change the code if you want to later. But um, that has saved me a ton of time is having them go and let themselves in and do the work as long as the tenant is up to date on everything that's happening. Yeah. Final question. Uh, I know for me, the most enjoyable part of what I absolutely the most enjoyable part of what I do hands down is when I tell the tenant, you got the house <laughs> and you see the expression on their face or faces, uh, the joy, the satisfaction, the happiness, and, and so on. That's just me. I don't know. What, what's, what's the most satisfying part of what you're doing? Uh, maybe that's my closing question. Uh, Marlon, I think you want to kick you off first. What's the most satisfying part of what you're doing so far? Um, it was the reaction uh, when I told uh, them they got the house. So um, I, I said, do you want to hear the good news or the bad news first? And uh, she said the bad news. So um, then I did the big reveal. And um, she said, that's not bad news. 
<laughs> and so she was just like overjoyed, smiling. Um, she was very, very, very happy. Um, she said she finally has a place that um, she can raise her family and they feel safe. Yeah. Okay, so that, Kev? That, that made oh, my heart glad. Okay. Kev? Yeah, I think real estate, you know, it's it's great. I, I, I'm not going to be the bad. I'm not going to be the bad guy here and say that the best part is going on Zillow and seeing that my house has gone up by 50,000. <laughs> That's not bad. Um, but but honestly, I do think that the people you get connected with the tenants, and then also people like Joe, like more experienced investors, even some of the the folks that you know, you run into who are doing work on your house. It's a people business. And it's fun to develop those relationships. And once you get around the right people, now people can be difficult and you have to grow as a leader and, and as a business person to manage them. But if you're doing business with people and it's a true win-win where the tenant enjoys where they're living, um, you're you know getting a benefit financially from them, but you're also growing as a, as a person and, and you're becoming better and better version of yourself over time. That to me is the most uh, rewarding part. Okay, Joe. Uh, yes, and so for me, yeah. Other than the the tenant reaction, the family at first when I tell them you got the house, I mean, one lady she was jumping like she was so excited because uh, she couldn't wait to get out of the house she was living in. Uh, to me, it was the how funny it was the kids how they would go and start picking their rooms. Oh, this is my room. This is my room. So to me, I was like, oh wow, like I'm providing this bedroom to this uh, little girl or boy like this is their own space right now and they're gonna grow in this uh, so to me that was like an eye-opening moment <laughs> you know that actually i'm providing something good and helping so that's exactly. very uh, rewarding yeah yeah so to the contrary i don't see these people as doors <laughs> I see them as kids who are like kids. I see these folks as families who are going to live in my house. And so it's just the, the human side of this thing. It's so, you know, I mean, you've got to have that in you, but it, it, it just brings so much joy to me. Know that I'm making a difference in people. Like, yes, I'm making money. I'm checking Zillow. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna deny. I'm not gonna deny. I'm not doing that. <laughs> but I'm also providing quality hosts to these families and making a difference in their lives. And to me, that brings it all together, and so on. So we are now pretty much done. Uh, again, on August the 25th, we do have a masterclass. So please sign up for that one. It's going to be great. We're going to talk about a lot of different things and how you can really leverage the power of uh, real estate to, 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 you know, to build wealth and also reduce evictions, turnover, and get great tenants. So again, sign up, HTTPS, bit.ly, forward slash landlord masterclass. Again, uh, wait for the scroller to go on. Uh, August 25th, Thursday, 7, uh, I think it's 8 o'clock, bit.ly, forward slash landlord masterclass. Please sign up there. You're going to have a good time. And I think you're going to learn a lot from that session. So again, uh, we do. I want to first of all thank our esteemed guest Kevin, Marlon, and Joe for being great uh, guests and sharing a lot of good wisdom, good information to the audience. I learned a lot, and I uh, hopefully all the audience learned a lot as well. So with that said and done, next week we're going to have another Wealth Wednesday, and so please tune in 7 p.m. Eastern time. I look forward to seeing you then. So with that said and done. Thanks a lot. Have a great evening. Take care, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.